And it's also seen with the little strokes as well. So I wanted to, to give you an example to show you exactly what the, the freezing gate is. So let's start off by showing you this. I'll try to cue it up. But... So this is actually how we measure uh, the, the freezing of gate. It's not very loud, and I'll just try to jump ahead. So essentially what it is, though, is uh, there's a scale from zero to four that we look at people for to evaluate their Parkinsonism, zero being if it's completely normal, four being the most severe of the symptoms. So uh, zero is when you're walking and there's no problems at all. Four is when there's complete absence of a movement forward, despite the intention to progress. So here you can see somebody who's, quote unquote, walking normally. And you look at a stride length and amplitude are two of the major things you want to look at. Here's an area of it's not just when, it always, when they're always typically walking, it's when they're turning, reaching their intended destination. And so you see the feet just get kind of stuck. I'll show you when he tries to turn. You can already see there's a little bit more of a magnetic component. His feet are right there. It takes a lot of little teeny steps to turn. Some, some call it festination. It's a fine line of whether you or not you believe it's a festinating gait or freezing of gait. This one's a little bit more obvious and you'll be able to tell a little bit better. And you can see already the gait is abnormal. It's decreased tri length and amplitude. There it is. Do you see that leg try to move and it just cannot? And you can imagine, I'm going to spare you from the other uh, two videos, but you can see how this person's getting stuck. So essentially it's like getting paralyzed when you're walking. You can imagine how, how terrifying that is. Uh, the biggest predictor of future falls are the fear of falling. So if you're walking and when you walk you get stuck and you're actually about to fall every time, of course you're going to be scared and of course falls will occur then. So, so it's, it's, it's um, fairly common. We'll go through that a little bit. But so the theorized pathophysiology of the freezing of game, um, it's a motor manifestation of dysfunctional information processing across networks. There's a limited ability to set shift, so to go from one cognitive domain to the next. And so uh, a lot of times when we try to dual task, ask people to do something while they're walking, it can reduce freezing of gait. Um, modulated locomotion, um, that's basically complicated walking. Uh, simple locomotion is walking in a straight line. Modulated locomotion is turning, things of that nature. Um, but freezing can also occur not just with gait. Um, people can actually have freezing when they're handwriting, uh, walk, uh, excuse me, uh, talking. Um, there's a lot of different activities that can reduce freezing. freezing. So uh, Parkinson's disease freezing of gait occurs in about 50% of patients. It's much more common than thought. Usually it occurs in the off state. Uh, Parkinson's, just to give a brief background, is due to a dopamine deficiency. A simple way to describe Parkinson's, um, just like your car needs fuel in order to drive, um, your brain needs dopamine for your body to move. So if your car doesn't have gas in the tank, what happens? It stalls, gets stuck, it sputters, similar to what dopamine happens. If, if you don't have, have a lack of dopamine, you you get stuck, you get stiff, you get a tremor. Um, so the medication we're giving is basically to replace the dopamine, and it's called carbidopa levodopa or cinnamon. And uh, we, we look at whether there's an on or off state. The on state is when the medication is working, when the tremor goes away, when the person is moving slowly, I mean, excuse me, moving uh, fluidly. Um, off state is more when the medication is off, uh, the tremor comes back, they get stuck. So usually the freezing of gait is levodopa responsive, and it commonly occurs when it's in the off state. Um, 36 to 38 percent of the episodes can occur in the on state. It usually happens in the later stages of Parkinson's disease. Excuse me, 26 percent of patients are with early Parkinson's disease who have not yet had levodopa therapy. Excuse me, again, will uh, develop freezing gait as well. So it is again one of the most debilitating motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Significant cause of falls, disability, uh, decreased quality of life, and Parkinson's disease in general. So uh, this is a fairly complicated slide. I'll try to. Uh, give you a little bit of a proposed mechanism for freezing your gait. So on the left here, um, you have the normal. And so basically what happens is you have your cortex. Your cortex uh, activates the striatum, which is the caudate, and the putamen. 
Um, when those are activated, the cotta and glutamate actually inhibit the globus pallidus interna, which in turn inhibits the thalamus in the, the mesencephalic locomotive region. So it's, it's a real complicated and oversimplified, honestly, uh, way of that Parkinson's disease and, the, and our movements work in general. Um, for freezing and gait, the, the idea is that there's basically a lack of dopamine, so your cortex takes on too much of a demand. It gets overloaded, it overstimulates the striatum, the striatum can't inhibit the globus pallidus interna, therefore, this it's a uh, double negative, the globus pallidus interna go, goes ahead and does inhibit the thalamus and the NLR, mesencephalic locomotor region. When that happens, you get stuck, and so that's the whole idea, and that's why it's leveled up or responsive in most cases. <clears throat> now, what we're doing, uh, there's, there's various ways of looking at freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease, and uh, neuroimaging is a very important component. Dr. Mishra is going to expand upon this as a very elementary kind of basic overview of this. Um, there are two major types of brain connectivity. There's structural brain connectivity, and these are obviously structural uh, associations between different neuronal elements. So there, there's two different ways, or a few different ways to oversimplify it again. Uh, morphometric correlation, and this looks at cortical thickness, gray matter volume, and surface area between brain regions. Then there's true anatomical connectivity. So this is a diffusion MRI, it analyzes the white matter tracks that basically connect the different gray matter regions throughout the brain. So now there are structural connectivity studies that have evaluated Parkinson's disease freezing of gait, and they show that there's reduced structural connectivity mainly between uh, what we call the fall guy, which is the pedunculopontine nucleus, and the cerebellum, thalamus, and multiple regions of the frontal cortex. And so you can see here an example of this. Um, in the far, uh, I guess, to your right, uh, where the red is, that's, that's where the pedunculopontine nucleus is really thought to, to land. Um, if pedunculopontine nucleus is kind of an ambiguous structure that actually, it's really pedunculopontine nuclei. There's several of them that span throughout the brainstem. <clears throat> and they've also found there's decreased uh, gray matter in the mesencephalic locomotor region in patients with Parkinson's disease freezing a gate as well. So the functional brain connectivity, this looks at functional associations between uh, uh, brain regions. So it measures temporal correlations between spatially remote neurophysiological uh, events using something called fMRI, functional MRI. So there's a bold or blood oxygen uh, level dependent signal fluctuations, and these represent areas of brain activity. So for example, if you see something, your occipital cortex will light up. Um, if you feel something, your sensory motor cortex will light up. Um, and then there are anatomically separated but functionally connected regions. These display a high level of uh, correlated bold signal activity. And these reproducible neural networks, they're called, excuse me, resting state networks. Now, there are several resting state networks. Um, the most commonly reported, it's up for debate, uh, depending on who you ask. Um, this shows you an example. The default mode network, it's kind of the resting state when the brain is just non-active. Um, the frontal parietal or executive attention network, called the FPN. Sensory motor network. There's the visual associative network, auditory network. And in cognition, the default mode network and frontal parietal networks are thought to be the most important and most relevant. Now, for the resting state fMRI studies of Parkinson's disease freezing of gait, let me show you an example. There's dysfunction, dysfunctional connectivity at the following regions. The default motor network, FPN, sensory motor network, visual associative network, not the auditory network. So we've narrowed down by one. So it's, it's not very uh, insightful. Now, the functional decoupling between the basal ganglia and the cognitive control networks that's been shown also by fMRI. And I think this is a little bit more insightful, um, basically showing that there is a lack of, of connectivity between the basal ganglia and the cortex itself. And so there's also there's a normal functional connectivity of the pedunculopontine network as well. So now there's previous studies of neuroimaging and Parkinson's disease freezing of gait, and they've identified incongruent abnormalities and connectivity between motor and non-motor pathways. So there's a lot of limitations of neuroimaging studies to date that they have evaluated Parkinson's disease freezing and gait. <clears throat> One is that they've evaluated functional or structural connectivity only, not both combined. Two, low statistical power. It's hard to find a lot of good patients with freezing and gait. Three, outdated analysis of imaging data. Four, imaging rarely is correlated with other findings, clinical or neuropsychological findings. 
And also, uh, they're not always evaluating patients with both the off and the on state, which is, uh, it, it doesn't give us insight into what's happening with this levodopa responsive phenomenon. There's also a dearth of longitudinal studies, and that's really the most important thing. Uh, you want to catch somebody when they start to have freezing of gait and then follow them over years and see what happens to, to the brain over time. So now the neuropsychological profile of Parkinson's disease freezing of gait, we, we know for a fact the severity of the freezing of gait correlates with the extent of cognitive impairment. So as somebody gets more cognitively impaired, the more freezing of gait they will have. But um, it's thought basically to be a, a, a component of frontal executive dysfunction. So this is related to inhibitory control. And what we found in imaging related to this is structural deficits in the right hemisphere locomotor network involving prefrontal cortical areas. Set shifting, as we were talking about before, the inability to kind of shift from the one, one component of the brain to another. And these are competing frontostriatal pathways, and they, can, they trigger episodes of freezing. Attention, which is difficulty with dual tasking. Uh, something that uh, physical therapists will often do is have somebody walk and try to carry a book on their head, calculate at the same time. That pretty much will induce, it's, it's called a freezer's nightmare. Um, now, the relationship between cognition and clinical features of uh, freezing of gait remains unclear. So, in assessing freezing of gait, what we do clinically is this kind of shabby, I'll be honest with you, freezing of gait questionnaire. Um, it's generic. Basically, what we ask is, do you feel that your feet get glued to the floor while making, uh, making a turn, walking, or when trying to initiate walking, and they call this freezing? And it's either zero, never, and again, up to four, which is always. Um, we get a lot of false answers from people who have neuropathy, who misunderstand this, um, what the freezing of gait is. So there's a new freezing of gait questionnaire that actually shows a video, which due to second time I can't show you. Um, but it shows patients an actual example so that they can look at it and see that themselves. So for the therapeutic management of, freeze, of PD freezing of gait, this looks very uh, extensive and it looks like there's a lot of options, but they're really not helpful, most of them. Um, I'll be honest, I think that uh, the, the physical therapy methods that are shown here are more helpful than medications. Um, basically, I, I, there are several tricks that patients have come up with that really the physicians have not, that are much more insightful. Some patients have canes, and they'll actually, when they're walking, when they get stuck and they start freezing, they'll kick their cane, and it actually just gets them going. Uh, one patient has a tennis ball, and he'll, when he's walking, gets frozen, he'll actually bounce the tennis ball on the floor, and then he runs after it and it gets him going again. Uh, I don't advise that to most of my patients because they'll fall, but, but uh, it is an interesting way to, get, to, to break the freeze. Uh, the dual testing, the focus attention to gait is probably the most important. I tell my patients, focus on the next step. Take one step at a time, tune everything else out, that's all you need to do. Um, in regards to medications, you can see what the trials have shown here. Um, anything that's level B or below is really kind of uh, disputable. Um, A2 there for uh, MARB inhibitors for recession or selegiline uh, is a little bit overzealous. Um, it's not as useful as, as I think that A2 should be. Um, amantadine is listed as level C. That's probably the most useful uh, medication. Amantadine is a has a lot of different uses. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist. Um, it's also a glutamate, uh, glutamatory, uh, glutaminergic, excuse me, medication. But most importantly, it releases a little bit of dopamine from the end of, uh, of nerve terminals. So it kind of, it's an extension of levodopa, is basically what it does. Um, here are some more uh, methods that have been tried for the therapeutic management of PDFOG. But in all honesty, these aren't that great. Um, we, need, we need therapies, and this is disabling it frequently, frequently occurs. So, so what I'm working on is something called a longitudinal study of multimodal imaging and cognition of Parkinson's disease freezing of gait. It's a very succinct title. Um, but the objectives are, there, because we have no unified etiology or pathophysiological framework of PDFOG, we need to study it. So we need to elucidate the etiology that's critical to development of uh, therapeutic interventions. We need to anticipate which PD patients are going to develop freezing of gait for clinical trials. And we need a comprehensive approach, and this is going to involve multimodal imaging, neuropsychological evaluation, clinical findings, and longitudinal studies. So the specific aims, number one, is to evaluate and compare brain network functional and structural connectivity using multimodal neuroimaging and Parkinson's disease for your gait, comparing this with Parkinson's disease and also with healthy participants. Specific aim number two is to establish a neuro, excuse me, neuropsychological 
and a clinical profile of Parkinson's disease freezing a gate, and then establish a correlation with those findings and what we see in the imaging. Now, in regards to participant recruitment, we're looking for 20 Parkinson's disease freezing of gait patients, 20 Parkinson's disease patients, and 20 healthy participants. We followed them longitudinally for two years at the following data points. Initially, one year, two years. The PD inclusion criteria for Parkinson's disease, uh, the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is based on four cardinal symptoms, which is resting tremor, bradykinesia is the cardinal most important symptom. Bradykinesia is slowness of movement. I always define it as uh, moving like, like one is trying to move through molasses. And uh, rigidity, usually cogwheel rigidity, like a cogwheel ratchets. And then postural instability, which is actually a later feature of Parkinson's disease. So, and then we were looking for people who are aged 50 to 80 years old. The exclusion criteria are more than a mild tremor. This is because it can affect the, uh, the fMRI for the most part. Um, it can interfere or cause some noise that can cancel out of what we're trying to look for. Um, their modified point in ER is basically a level of how they're doing overall. That score greater than four means that they're wheelchair bound, so they're not going to be able to walk. Um, dementia or significant cognitive impairment. It, it's a confound. Um, once somebody is demented, there's a lot of other brain structures that are involved. We can't really isolate what, what is the pathway in Parkinson's disease freezing your gait by that point. So the inclusion criteria, uh, they must also score one or greater on that freezing of gait questionnaire. We do use the new freezing of gait questionnaire. Um, also the patient's recognition of the condition when I demonstrate it to them, which is always fun for the patients to watch. And then, or observation of freezing of gait during the clinical examination. And that's when I actually watch the patient walking and I can see them actually freeze. So in regards to the neuroimaging, um, we're looking at fMRI functional connectivity analysis of resting state networks in Parkinson's disease freezing of gait. And so you can see here what previous studies have shown, the right frontal parietal network, um, the, the middle frontal gyrus, angular gyrus, cell, the executive attention network, visual network, sensory motor network, default mode network, excuse me, visual associative network, but not the auditory network. Again, we're not gonna look at that when that has been rolled out. And then we're gonna look at a task-based fMRI. And this is actually, uh, it's been done by another group, but uh, kudos to our imaging team for kind of pushing me along to using this. Um, there's a virtual reality paradigm that patients can actually uh, watch while they're in a scanner. This is an example of what the uh, previous team in Australia has used. And so they actually have a, a patient walking through this little corridor. And the, while they're in the scanner, they step on the pedals. The pedals you have to depress more than 30 degrees for it to be counted as a step. So if it goes 15 degrees and they stop, that's a freezing episode. They don't count that as a step. They don't move forward in, this, in the virtual reality paradigm. So um, another ins insightful thing that Dr. Cordes pointed out is that in the uh, uh, virtual reality paradigm, that they're looking at these cognitive loads. They're actually looking more at what the cognitive aspects are, and that will light up on the fMRI itself. It's just a cognitive deficit. So we're really, again, trying to isolate what exactly freezing and gait is and where, what areas the brain that correlates to. By inducing freezing and gait with a cognitive overload task, you're showing what the brain is, is demonstrating while being cognitively overloaded, not necessarily freezing and gait. Um, we're also going to do structural connectivity analysis. Now, previous studies, again, they really shown that the pedunculal pontine nucleus is kind of the, uh, the most important uh, uh, structure involved. Now, <laughs> thankfully, again, our imaging team is very advanced. We'll have a good uh, 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 presentation from Dr. Mishra next. But we'll look at diffusion-weighted imaging with voxel-based and graph theory-based techniques, probabilistic tractography to create corticostriatal anatomic connectivity maps, graph theory techniques to probe topological differences in structural connectivity, track-based spatial statistics will investigate white matter integrity, and free water imaging, which as Dr. Mishnah was just discussing, we don't know what free water exactly is, but it evaluates uh, white matter fiber structure. And so we're also, as we pointed out before, in the previous studies, they didn't look at functional and structural imaging, both combined, and, and that's, that's a very important point of, the point of this uh, study. Um, we're going to develop a functional and structural MRI-based biomarker of Parkinson's disease freezing your gait. You need biomarkers because if you're going to have a therapeutic intervention, you have to see uh, if that's improved. The biomarker will tell you if that is improved. So it also will improve our understanding of the relationship between functional and structural connectivity, not only in Parkinson's disease freezing your gait and PD, but also in general. Now, the neuropsychological test for Project 2 
Yeah, there's three different projects for this Cobra grant. Um, the two other ones are Alzheimer's disease related. And so we use the core neuropsychometric uh, testing battery. And that's uh, listing all these below, dementia rating scale, MOCA. But then we're also going to look more at uh, uh, freezing of gait specific uh, neuropsychological evaluations. And this is a phonemic verbal fluency, the go, no go task, which is a measure of response inhibition. Um, a Stroop task is a measure of uh, mental flexi flexibility, and so that's also response inhibition, but it's also set shifting as well. So our physical therapists are, are very good too, we're lucky, and UNLV have a very good department as well. Um, so we're looking at the timed up and go and freezing and gait assessments. These are validated measures of assessing Parkinson's disease patients who are at risk for falls, but more importantly, they incorporate evaluation of freezing and gait itself. The performance is impacted by cognitive deficits and domains that are associated with freezing and gait. And all these patients are going to perform these in the off and on state. And we with Parkinson's disease will do this test in the off state where they're more likely to have episodes of freezing and gait. And then again in the on state when they're less likely to. So in conclusion, Parkinson's disease is a common disabling phenomenon that leads to falls, reduced quality of life. The studies show compromised structural integrity and transient functional disconnection between subcortical and cortical regions. There is maladaptive neural uh, compensation during conflicting motor, cognitive, or emotional stimulus processing. And this causes an acute network overload, not least in the freezing of gait. And so this is from a journal of Parkinson's disease in 2015. And uh, I, I found this after I started the project and I was kind of supported the idea of what we were trying to do, which is a multimodal neuroimaging approach that combines structure and function, including network connectivity, will be important to unravel critical mechanisms, mechanisms underlying freezing and gain Parkinson's disease. So if you do uh, know of anybody who has Parkinson's disease, anybody with Parkinson's disease freezing and gain, or a healthy participant, uh, you can feel free to contact me at this email address. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. And uh, should I field any potential questions now or let Dr. Mishra talk and then? Why don't we do questions now? Now? Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, this is the first part of your talk, but yeah. are your patients matched ethnically and sex matched? Yes, ex excellent question. Uh, age, uh, sex, ethnicity, education is very important. Anytime you're looking for cognition. Um, we're also going to match on UPDRS3 uh, motor severity. So some other studies have looked at patients who, you know, they're at the beginning stages of Parkinson's and then studies who are in the later stages of Parkinson's, but and try to match those. And that's just not, it's matching apples and oranges. But yes, we are going to match by testing as well as sex and age and education. So, so the current patients of the 20 with uh, FOG and PD and control, these are normal Europeans? Or? No, it's a mix. It's a mix. Um, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I would probably say about 80% Caucasian and 10% um, African American and 10% Asian. That, that's, that's probably the, uh, yeah. And that, that actually reflects more of what we see, not ideally, but, but in Las Vegas for Parkinson's disease in general. And oh, genom genomically? No, no. I've talked with uh, with Dr. Kinney. I don't know if you're and and, and he's he, we're we're discussing this potentially. It, it would be a very interesting idea. It's a good thought. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in regard to your patients, testing them in the off and the on state, are you going to take into account medical marijuana use? No, actually, that's going to be a contraindication, unfortunately, for for being a participating in the study because uh, it really is not gonna affect the structural imaging that we're looking at, but functional fMRI, that is gonna affect that. And I'm also trying to eliminate benzodiazepines, patients who use that, because we, Dr. Michelle, I'm not sure if you're gonna elaborate on, on this more, but we were just discussing that the fMRI is very uh, state dependent. So it's like you, you're you in one, let's say you're in medical marijuana, your fMRI is gonna be different when, you, when it's the intoxicating effects or whatever are in your system versus when they're not. So I'll give you a very long-winded answer of saying no.